and determined if it is the top of such a figurative hyperbolic curve as the last possible recombination of all possible combinations depends on which combination one would use to start such a long sequence. The most important aspect of this line of reasoning is often overlooked by those studying it. The I Ching serves as a calendar because the 64 possible hexagrams are comprised of a total of 384 Tao lines, and there are exactly 384 nights in a 13-month lunar cycle. The lunar calendar records the real number of full moons per solar year and differs from the fixed number of days in the standard solar orbit-based calendar. While in China, the sages were arranging the apparently limitless recombinations of the 64 I Ching hexagrams. They were in Vedic India, writing in a language called Sanskrit. Sanskrit is an oriental phonetic alphabet and evolved from Proto-Ganges script in much the same way and at around the same time as Egyptian hieroglyphics appear to have evolved from Ugaritic linear A. However, unlike the seemingly limitless vocabulary of languages based on ideographic letters such as ancient Egyptian or modern Chinese, Sanskrit has a fixed number of possible letters based on a limited range of audible sounds produced in a combination of pronunciations. The Sanskrit alphabet has 50 letters. Sanskrit is not directly relevant to the number of King Wen sequence I Ching hexagrams on the surface, since the number of the first order of difference between them would be 64 minus 50 equals 14, which is only twice 7, the number symbolizing the planets and chakras. However, if the eight double hexagrams are taken as literally meant to be expressed twice, and the sum of 64 hexagrams is increased from 64 to 72, then the number of Sanskrit letters being 50, which is in turn 22 less than 72, becomes somewhat more relevant. At the same time the most ancient Vedic myths and fables were being recorded in Sanskrit in India, across the Hindu Kush mountain range southwest of the Himalayas, in the fertile crescent region of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers valley, nowadays the arid deserts called Iraq, their alphabet was cuneiform, a partially phonetic, partially ideographic dialect of a variant total number of letters. But the 50 Sanskrit letters of the Indus River Valley were venerated, instead, as the 50 names of Marduk in the Babylonian pre-Hebrew Genesis in Numa Elish. These 50 names of Marduk were, originally, the names of 50 Anunnaki, watchers, who, according to the older Sumerian myths, were aliens from another planet. Regardless of the origins of the Anunnaki of Sumeria, the fifty names in the Enuma Elish are a comparable concept from ancient Mesopotamia to the fifty Sanskrit letters. The Sumerian Anunnaki may have been as few as fifty or any number more, however Marduk was only one. The original monotheist faith was not the solar worship instituted by Amenhotep IV when he built Karnak and was renamed Akhenaten. It was, and remains to this day, the worship of Marduk, the monotheist patron deity of Babylon. Marduk is the god whom the Old Testament is based on. Marduk is the devil, Satan, worshipped as Moloch at Bohemian Grove. Marduk is Krishna, appearing to Arjuna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra in his many-armed form, saying, Now I am become death the destroyer of worlds. Marduk is Apuk of the Mayan Popol Vuh and related codices. Marduk was the archetypal great burner in his role in Babylonian myth as the bringer of the hot winds that killed off all the gods after the flood, just after the erection of the Tower of Babel 
and the confusion of the tongues at the time of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, when Abraham fled the lands of Ur and entered the lands of Egypt. The significance of Marduk's fifty names is, once again, related to the fifty letters of the Sanskrit alphabet. When you combine the fifty letters of Sanskrit in the form of the fifty names of Marduk with the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet, the result is the seventy-two letter Shemhamphorash. Here we see the arrangement of the twenty-two letters of the Hebrew alphabet called the 231 gates of Benah. Each of the 231 gates is symbolized here by a line connecting one letter to another. Each letter is connected to all 22 others by a single line or gate, and thus there are 231 lines or gates connecting all 22 letters when they are arranged in a circle as such. In this arrangement, as in the next, we begin at the position of the uppermost left with Aleph and proceed counterclockwise toward Beth and then proceed around counterclockwise until we read Tao on the uppermost right. In this arrangement of the 231 gates diagram for the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, we do not see them as Hebrew letters at all but rather as their shorthand notation symbols representing the three alchemical elements, the seven Olympic planets, and the twelve Babylonian zodiac signs. We begin with Aleph equals air, and proceed around counterclockwise to Beth equals moon, and so forth until we come to Tao equals Jupiter. The attribution of what traits to which letters, and vice versa, has been a matter of long debate among literary Kabbalists, and appears to remain more or less arbitrary. The overall number is important, wherein there are 22 Hebrew letters only because there are 22 attributes symbolized by the three elements, seven planets and twelve zodiac signs, just as there are twelve consonants and seven vowels in Greek for the same reason. All arrangements of these symbols on such a circle obeying the format of the 231 gates of Benah will eventually repeat patterns that can also occur as star charts in astrology. The Dendara zodiac of the Osiris Hathor Temple of ancient Egypt is the oldest known structure depicting the constellations of the northern night sky. With almost no alterations, the same chart is used to this day in astrology. We see Aries in the upper right, proceeding counterclockwise around to Taurus in the upper left, and so forth. There are three figures in the middle that do not appear to reflect the traditional characteristics of the tropical zodiac's originally Babylonian signs. These symbolize the Big Dipper as an ox leg, Draco as Sobek, and Vega as a small fox. Also around the outer edge, outside of the circle formed from the signs of the tropical zodiac, are 36 deacons, each symbolizing one week of 10 days in a 360-day solar calendar with five holidays used as the Egyptian civic calendar during the Old and Middle Kingdoms. The 36 deacons of the Egyptian solar civic calendar represent an idea almost identical to the 50 names of Marduk. They are thought to be at once anthropic deities and measures of time on a calendar. It is for this very good reason we say the earliest authentically Hebrew Hakabalists were schooled on metaphysics in Egypt. All of Egyptian religion in the form of worship as deified, the ideograms of their liturgical literature was entirely based on study of the anthropomorphic expression as combined homozoomorphs of complex advanced levels of metaphysical thought. To analyze the role in their cosmology of each Egyptian god would take much longer than I have time for here. Suffice it to say that these 36 Egyptian deacons 
are the key to fully unlocking the meaning of the 72 letter Shimham Farash as one fifth called a jubilee of a 360 day calendar model. The next step in the history of the 360 day calendar model came when the Habaru speaking Hyksos, shepherd kings of Lower Egypt, followed Akhenaten and his brother Tutmosis calling themselves Moses and Aaron, into exile out of Egypt and into the wastelands of the Sinai Peninsula in an event the Bible records as the Exodus. One particular aspect of great interest to literary Kabbalists from the book of Exodus describing these events was the description of Moses calling upon God to part the Red Sea. The magical incantation deriving from this account forms 72 angel names of three letters length each, when the three sentences of 72 letters each are read as rows along columns rather than as columns along rows. The total sum of all the letters in this passage combined forms the Shemham Farash of 216 letters. 216 is three-fifths of 360. Likewise, 72 times 2 equals 144, which is a Fibonacci number, or a number that occurs in the set of additive sums, where each integer is the sum of the digits of the two prior integers to it on the list. Beginning with 1 plus 1 equals 2, where 1 plus 2 equals 3, 2 plus 3 equals 5, 3 plus 5 equals 8, and so forth, on up to the twelfth iteration of 89 plus 55 equals 144. When plotted onto a Cartesian coordinate graphing chart, these Fibonacci numbers will naturally occur on points forming a golden ratio spiral. Here we see the second group of 72 derived from the 216 letter Exodus verse Shemham Farash, known as the Goetic Shemham Farash, referring to a practice of black magic forbidden by monotheism. Just as the Shemham Farash itself was considered angelic, so was its counterpart, the Goetic Shemham Farash, considered demonic. The demonic Gosha version of the Shemham Farash provides sigils or mason's marks for each of the 72 demons it signifies. These were believed to have been the original builders' insignias emblazoned on the bricks each laid while they were enlisted by King Solomon to help build the first temple to God. The Goetic sigils were either used later or invented and backdated from during the Middle Dark Ages, toward the end of the Inquisition and the dawning of the Age of Enlightenment. They were used in ritual evocation or a magical ceremony involving the physical activity of the magician in order to summon a tangible manifestation of one of the Goetic demons. This was accomplished by a magus standing inside a so-called magic circle and conjuring or gesturing with a wand to accentuate and stir up chaos energy toward the accomplishment of their will. According to the Middle Dark Age grimoires, some of which were translated by S. L. McGregor Mathers, there were two keys to unlocking the mystery of the Shemham Farash of 216 letters from the Exodus verse. One was the greater key of King Solomon, a system based on assigning 36 talismans among the seven planets, and the other, the lesser key, the Goetia of King Solomon, assigning 